But I want to talk to you today about a tale of two trees. And this is a message I preached probably 10 years ago. But uh, I've reworked it some because I'm a different person than I was 10 years ago. I've learned some stuff and learned maybe how to better present this message that I think is a very important message. And it was uh, in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, but even in the New, there are illustrations that are given, okay? And I think the one thing that everybody can relate to is how many of you folks have a tree in your yard? How many have more than one kind of tree? How many have some bushes in your yard? I mean, you have like poison ivy or poison oak in your yard. Yeah, I have that too, okay? And uh, yeah, we have all kinds. So we, I think everybody can relate to this. Now, if you were in the Mississippi Delta, people could relate to it, but we had a lot of cotton fields and flat crop areas. I mean, flat for 50 miles. I mean, there wasn't a hill anywhere. I mean, you think this area is flat. No, that, that was flat, flat. Florida was flat. I remember going, taking the, the senior adult group on this uh, wildlife uh sort of ranch thing we went to. And I remember we went over this slight incline. They said, that's the highest point here in the state of Florida. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it was just a little tiny, I mean, it wasn't much of a hill at all. That's it, you know, that's, uh, there were no hills like this. So uh, those of you that live out in Kennefick or where I live there, my part of Dayton, there are a few hills, but then it flattens back out. So, uh, but yeah, but we all had trees. And that's the one thing that we noticed when we moved into this area where we were in Florida, we lived in Cape Coral, and uh, a lot of the trees and things had been cut down years ago. These two developers back in the 50s and 60s cleared out dug canals everywhere, and everything was flat. And so there were just very few trees in our area, which meant that my power bill was really high because there's no shade on my house. So um, you didn't have any shade. It beat right down on us. So, so we appreciated that about this area. So, But we have... Um, The prophet Jeremiah makes an observation. He compares people to trees here. There's two types of trees. There's two types of people. So we're going to go to verse 5 of Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8. And we're going to begin reading here. And a tale of two trees. We're going to read out of the English Standard Version. The scriptures will be on the screen. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes, for its leaves remain and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Sam, are you still ready for that scripture I was supposed to have you read? Okay, would you do that for a moment before we pray? Would you look up? I want Sam to come up here and read the first psalm because you're going to see how it ties in. I meant to have that done just a little earlier, but it's on my mind and I just don't feel like I should let it go. Uh, I don't know what translation she's using, but she listen <laughs> and she reads it. The first psalm, psalm number one, all six verses. They won't be on your screen, but listen as she reads the first psalm. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or sit, stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instructions and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its seasons and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are chaff the wind that blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Thank you, Sam. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for you showing us the way to an abundant life. And we acknowledge that that abundant life is not necessarily an easy life, but it's a blessed life. And we want to live a blessed life. We want to be like that one that's planted by the streams of water. We want to be people who are fruitful. But Lord, we recognize that so often it's easy to get on the wrong track and to be unfruitful people. And a lot of times we don't even know what it really means to be fruitful. We think it means to be successful or to be well-loved or well-liked. And uh, remind us today of, uh, and help us to understand more clearly what it means to really follow you, what it means to really serve you, and how we can 
come to have that life that we find satisfaction in you today. Uh, I know, Lord, that Jennifer in her Billy Graham counseling ministry is running into many people that she talks to, especially late at night who are anxious, not just about COVID, but about so many things in life. Their life seems so barren, and they even feel that they're crying out to you and see no answers. But help us, Lord, to get back to your word. We know so many of them are asked about reading the word or are connecting with the people of God in church, and they don't do that. And they're trying to make it on their own. And their life is barren uh, instead of satisfied. Instead of finding satisfaction, they're anxious. They're upset. And Lord, I'm burdened about those people. I've been there. I know what to need. I'm burdened about these folks here that you would help us to live in the blessing you have for us. So Lord, today, help me to proclaim your word, to not share any stupid or foolish opinions that I have, but to share only what the word of God says. Open up our hearts and minds to receive it. I pray and I ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, as we look at this passage of Scripture, uh, I don't have a long intro. That's one thing Genebeth has probably noticed. Hey, Dad, you don't have, you don't have two pages of intro here. So we will not have a 17-minute intro to this message today. I'll let Sam's reading of Scripture be the intro. And we're going to move right into talking about the tale of two trees. And we start with verse 6. Here that um, there's two types of trees, and uh, as you fill in the blank there, we see the barren tree, okay? And that's in verse 6. In the King James Version, it says the heath in the desert, or my uh, translation, ESV, says a shrub in the desert. And it meant uh, bare, naked, destitute. It was just a, a shrub. I have some of those. I have, um, I have some orange trees that I actually... Uh, I actually got from Darlene and, and Cheryl's family a few years ago. And two of them survived the freeze. One of them didn't make it. And I finally cut it down. And that one is bare. That's why I cut it down. It's just no leaves anywhere, nothing. One of them survived really well. One, some shoots down at the bottom survived. I'm not starting over, but I am going to get to... I'm probably two years behind now in my growth again. But... Yeah, I had to get rid of that. It's just sitting there. I mean, I have uh, an azalea tree, an uh, azalea bush, I should say, and uh, it's beautiful azaleas, and uh, one of them didn't make it. You know, it just, it's barren. I need to pull it up so uh, and get rid of it. Uh, it's just ba- bare. It's naked. It's just destitute. There's nothing there. And it says this particular shrub or this, this uh, heath here in the desert, it was excluded from religious uses because it had neither fruit nor seed, and nobody sowed it or planted it. In other words, it was a weed-like kind of bush, okay? You ever had some of those? I noticed in Florida, we had a situation where uh, almost every house that you rented or bought, it was included that you would have a sprinkler system, So, uh, and which that wasn't so bad because where I live, we actually had wells. So I didn't have to, uh, I would not want that in the city of Dayton where I live because they not only charge me for the water I use, they charge me a sewage charge, and no matter, well, I could put it on the ground, it never goes into the sewer, I still end up paying, they basically double what my water bill is. So I'm glad I don't have sprinkler system in my house. And uh, I sort of, if it dies a little bit, I'm like, okay, that's good, we ain't got to cut the grass for a couple of weeks, you know? And um, anyway, but uh, we haven't had that problem this year with all the rain we've had. But yeah, but we, we had these, these sprinkler systems, and uh, but I would notice in the wintertime, uh, you know, grass, and again, we didn't have cold, cold winters there. I mean, we might have a freeze, but a lot of times, you know, our winter there was 75 degrees for the high and, uh, you know, maybe 55 for the low. But the grass wouldn't grow as quickly, but I noticed that different, the, we would have some wind. A lot of times, it would, even though I was on the Gulf side, it would come a lot of times from the east wind, from the Atlantic Ocean, and it would blow various things into your yard, things that I didn't sow. And when I went to cut my grass more regularly in April, oh, it was... I didn't put this here, but there was stuff I didn't sow, but just these useless weeds, you know, just terrible things, you know. Uh, we'd get sand dollar a lot. We'd get a couple of other uh, weeds and things, and you'd have to, and you had to be careful about spraying this, um, there was this Scott's, I think, it's not spray, it's actually a, is it a Scott's weed and feed. I think you have to be careful. People would throw that out, and what that does is it helps the grass to grow, but it kills the weed, and they would find out, wow, I had way more weeds than I had grass. They had to go plant new grass. So there's these useless things, and this heath was that way. And really, it's like uh, it represents uh, 
the barren tree, the heath, the, the shrub, the naked shrub, the destitute shrub, shrub, it represents, it's the person whose trust who trust in humans and human institutions for their source of hope instead of God. It says in verse 5, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, who hearts, whose heart turns away from the Lord. I ran into a dear Christian brother the other day at the restaurant that I love very much. And we were talking about spiritual things, but then he said something that broke my heart. He said, man, I just think we've got to become more political to change things. And I'm like, oh, no. No, I've been down that road. You know, when I was in my early 20s, I was a card-carrying member of the moral majority. I gave money to that. Well, wasn't that a good thing? Well, yeah, I mean, there were some good things done. But um, I had a chance, if you're trusting in politics, I was on Twitter a few weeks ago and uh, had a chance to talk to a person that was a Democratic Party strategist. Y'all ready? He believes in all the things that the Democratic Party's doing. But he said... There were these guys, one of them is even a politician from Texas who's very popular. He said, yeah, this guy went on Fox News and blasted me as this terrible guy, you know, told everybody how horrible and wicked I was. But said, I ran into him one day uh, in, uh, in the bathroom somewhere, and he said, man, you're just doing a great job. Appreciate what you're doing. You're excellent at what you do. I think he just blasted me in front of everybody and told them how horrible I was. But do you really believe that? Or are you just telling your constituency that? But really... Another guy, he said, now I had worked with him on some projects. He was able to work with other people that were different from him. But he said, the guy went on Fox News again and blasted me. Told everybody that watch it, how horrible I was and I was so dangerous to America. But said, I ran into him on the steps of the Capitol building and he stopped me and said, hey, been a while since I've seen you. There's this great restaurant in town. Uh, me and you need to go there and hang out. Now, his constituency believed that guy, and, and, and he, most of us would, would agree with that particular politician and the things he said. But a lot of these guys don't mean what they say, you know. And I'm not saying, go vote for people and do that. And I would love to see a lot of y'all run for office here locally. That's how you're going to really make the difference, by the way. Politics starting local. We're going to make the difference politically, I mean, even spiritually, locally, as you win people to Jesus. As you talk to folks, you need to quit trusting in humans and human institutions because human beings apart from Christ will lie to you. And you've got to know when you're being played. And I think it's time to realize we've been played and we have a remedy. And I'm seeing it in the restaurant where I work. I'm seeing it in other places sharing Jesus with people, living for people. And guess what? That's, that's sort of the, we don't like that way because that's not quick enough or easy enough. I want to go into a voting booth and click a ballot or, or circle something and say, I've done my part. I stood against abortion because I circled this thing and said, well, I'm voting for this person who's pro-life. I talked to one of our local leaders a few years ago who claims to be pro-life. He's a Republican. He kept trying to change the subject when I talked about it, when I had a personal conversation with him. Now, he'll tell you he's, he's against it. But he doesn't care about it one way or the other. You, you know, so what I'm saying is quit worrying that that's not the solution. Trusting in people and in institutions is not the solution. Right. When the Jesus movement came along, I'm reading a book about Larry Norman, and Larry is a controversial guy. He was one of the early Christian rock guys. He was very evangelistic. He had some wrong ideas about the church and got frustrated with the organized church. But I do share some of his frustrations about the organized church as a pastor. Um, I don't tell everybody that's not in church that they don't immediately get back in church if they've been hurt. I do try to lead them back to it, but I don't fuss at them about it. I found out that Hebrews 10.25 where he says, uh, we, 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 maybe the Apostle Paul or whoever the writer was, that said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some, uh, was not Paul fussing at people, but he was saying, y'all really don't need to miss because here's why. Because we need to build one another up. It wasn't a fuss at somebody. It was an exhortation and an encouragement. And I think we've got to get back to helping people. Personally getting involved in people's lives. I think we've got to rely on the Lord and His power. And God doesn't do things in your time. And you want to see, there's been a couple of great awakenings that happened in this nation. One was the first great awakening that led to the American Revolution. It happened in the 1700s. In the 1800s, we began to fall away. There was another uh, great awakening. It happened with some guys in New York State meeting 
I think in a barn or in some other upstairs room, about 10 guys started praying. Well, what's that going to do? We need to organize a committee. We need to form this organization to, to defeat. No, no. They cried out to God, and then God began to work. And we saw, even through the Civil War, in the Union and Confederate Army, many people got saved. There was a revival that happened. And then, uh, so there's things that happen there. There's things that we grow in the Lord. There, um, God's power is, is evident, but we need to lean on His power. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. But we see here this quote from Matthew Henry. I love Matthew Henry. He said, cleaving to the cistern. Y'all know what a cistern is. If you know what a cistern is, I need to explain that. What's a cistern? Can anybody tell me what a cistern is? It holds water, rainwater. Holds rainwater. Holds water. That's what they used in that day and time. They didn't, they didn't have, well, some of the, we just talk about this in Sunday school. Some ancient civilizations did have a way for running water to get in. But still, you needed a cistern. You didn't have this electric pump that pumped it in your house, okay? So here it is. He said, but cleaving to the cistern that holds water uh, is leaving the fountain and is presented by God. A cistern is a, is a good thing, but, and we're going to get to this at the end of the message, God is our fountain. Sometimes we're, uh, the, uh, Jeremiah said this, I believe it's in Jeremiah 2, where he talks about how, let me just turn back to that. You can even... I'm going to go to that just a minute. Yes, Jeremiah 2, yeah, 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And I'll go to this next point because I think it's going to make, it's going to explain what I'm talking about here. Point B here, a dry parts life will be the lot of the one who refuses to rely on God. It says in verse 6, he is like the shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. Here's a great quote from Alexander McLaren. Do I have that in there, Genevieve? I think I do. There it is. There it is. God comes, and I would rather have some more money. God comes, and I prefer some woman's love. God comes, and I would rather have a prosperous business. God comes, and I prefer beer. The man that cannot see good when it is there before his face, because the false direction of his confidence has blinded his eyes, cannot open his heart to it. It comes, but it does not come in. It surrounds him, but it does not enter into him. Blind, blind, blind are multitudes of us. But go back to this thing, these things, that the, the money, the woman's love, the prosperous business, even beer. You know those are things that in and of themselves the Bible does not totally con con condemn. There's places that they are told that they're okay. I mean money. Is money the root of all evil? No, sir. No. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. It's okay to have money. A woman's love, or by the way, a man's love. It's not wrong to have that, but don't you know people that pursue that all the time? Uh, and the, also in things today, we have pornography that runs rampant. We have people that are sexually immoral today. You'll see so many people today that don't even know about God's standards of a uh, you know, of sexual intimacy. And it's not just in the homosexual situation, it's in heterosexual situations. People are honoring the, the regulations that God gives to bless us. Uh, prosperous business, nothing wrong with that. It can be used for, for God's kingdom. Uh, even beer, and I don't encourage you to drink beer, but the Bible does say, I serve in a church that we changed the church covenant to where we encouraged abstinence from alcohol. We didn't forbid it. Because the Bible doesn't totally forbid it. I don't think you ought to drink it. I think there's a lot of, I think you'd be better off to stay away from it. Okay? You really would. It, it, there's more bad stuff that can happen than good. Okay? They're right. Now, I'll admit that I think the NyQuil that you take today doesn't work as well. They took the alcohol out of it, you know? Uh, you, you drink it and you go to sleep and you get some really good rest. And I think that was as much a part of your healing as the medication. You just needed to sleep. You needed to rest. You need to be knocked out. You know, I was singing as a, a, a teenager, and I was a, had this little trio. I was singing with this young man that played a little guitar, and his dad wasn't a Christian. He drank some, but I remember I was having this bad sinus thing. I was just getting all this drainage in my throat. He mixed up a little bit of whiskey and some honey and some lemon, and uh, it didn't cure me, but there for a while, it was, I could get that junk out of my throat, and I could sing a little bit, and they'd come back, and that way I didn't work, and I couldn't keep sipping that, so uh, I didn't keep doing it. But yeah, all these, none of these things in themselves are evil, but what happens is we pursue those things instead of pursuing God. Right. And that leaves you to have a dry life. 
We even see here in point C, a barren, dry life will be the lot of the one who refuses to surrender to God and depend upon Him. It says, He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. We see many people today, and I see it in churches, where we're looking to uh, appeal to, I guess, uh, just sort of a nominal, middle-class kind of lifestyle. And if you are a little broken or a little messed up or you've made great mistakes, you know, uh, I worked with somebody that uh, messed up the other day. We wondered where she was. Well, she'd been in jail for the parking ticket she had in 2010, okay? She isn't uh, the wisest person in, in that situation, but uh, I didn't look down my nose at her because guess what? I've made some mistakes. How many of y'all have done something stupid in your life? Amen. Okay. So instead of looking, well, you ought to know better, right? I just, yeah, I'm sorry that you did that. I'm glad you're back with us. You know, that's all she needed to hear. I was there wasn't no help. I mean, I mean, I, I can later share some wisdom, and I do that. But, uh, you know, this, this is what happened to the Pharisees. A lot of things the Pharisees said were right. Not everything, but their heart was condemning toward people. The Sadducees the same way. Uh, now, I'll be honest with you, if I love you and you're doing something really stupid, I should probably bring you, take you aside and try to counsel with you to not do that. And it may make you mad, but that's different from having a condemning attitude. That's different from, uh, that's different from looking down on people who are struggling. And today, uh, we've got to realize that some of the, and I'm all for it, man, I'm thankful for America. I'm thankful that we have freedom today to witness still, to talk yes, about Jesus. And we still have more freedom than we think we do. Right. I want to tell you that y'all got to be careful about one thing here because this leads to relying on man too. There are a lot of Christians today that have this ah kind of attitude. Now the sky's been falling for years. Yes, there's things that are wrong. Yes, there are things that are bad. Yes, there are things that have been happening in the government and things that are bad. But here's the deal. You sitting around and worrying about it, griping about it, doesn't fix any of it, does it? I find if something's wrong, like, you know, what are you going, like, if your house is falling down, what are you going to do? You've got to find some way to start fixing it. That's right. You can lament about it. You can get on social media and this is bad. I need somebody to cut my grass, you know. Uh, Bentley and I, Bentley, uh, there's a lady down the street that hired him to cut her grass. And, you know, we didn't have any big shot mower. We had, we just had this new push mower we bought. And I'm a little worried that we're going to wear it out. But uh, grass was this high. But between... Uh, he took the mower, he raised it up a little bit. Uh, I went and got a weed eater, and I even pulled out my old sling blade. We knocked it down, and we fixed it. And the lady now has a yard that she can, and she's an elderly lady that needed some help. Of course, she, she paid him for it too, but the deal was, was you can gripe about it. I'm more of a can-do. What can we do about it? What can we do to fix it? And we've got all power of God in our life if we will depend on Him but I think a lot of people are angry because they're depending on other people. They see the problems of life. Even these people that Jennifer counseled with, she'll ask many of them, have you been reading the Bible? No. Uh, are you fellowshipping with people in church? No. And uh, won't even consider it. And, uh, you know, you've got to do things God's way first, okay? Uh, or you're going to be dry and barren. Even if you cry out to God. If you cry out to God and resist His wisdom, you're wrong. So that, that's the barren tree. The barren person who's trusting in things, trusting in human institutions, trusting in individuals. I mean, how many of you have been betrayed by somebody? Oh, oh, come on, yeah. Come on, it hurts, doesn't it? Ouch. You know what really hurts is to be betrayed by people in the church that say that, ooh. How many of you have been betrayed by a pastor before? Mm, me. I've been on staff. That's right. How many have been betrayed? And then, by the way, you forgive people because some of the guys that I had difficulty with, I'm friends with today. I'm thankful that, you know, God, they were going through a tough time, I found out, and their thinking wasn't right, and I learned to forgive them, you know. And we get along great today. I have other people I've cut totally out of my life because they're just toxic, you know. They keep thinking about them. just bothers me in my mind. I can't press on to what I need to do, so I'll click that unfriend button on Facebook and move it on, you know. And I'll pray for them if they're sick. And, uh, but I got I got things to do. I got I got things to move. I got to move forward. But uh, but people betray you. But guess what? Jesus knows what that feels like. People betray him too. So guess what? He learned obedience through what he suffered. So we have to go through that. 
But we don't have to be barren in it. Because we can be, secondly, point number two, the fruitful tree. It says in verse 8, and this is why I had Sam read Psalm 1. It says in verse 8, He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream, does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green, is not anxious in the year of drought. It's not anxious, folks, in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. So here's what Jeremiah did. He first removed the weeds and then the blanks it's their false trust so that there might be room for the good grain. So these things I've told you not to trust in, I'm not going to keep bringing them up because we've already talked about them. We're not going to give people and betrayal and hard times in life and these other things. We're not going to give them the glory. We're going to give God the glory. Let's remove those things out of our life. And here's what we have to be careful about. Some of those things can be religious ritual. Okay, some of those things can be showing up. You can make a God out of going to church. You can make a God out of how much of the Bible you read instead of being humble and letting it change your life. We can make a God out of singing gospel music. We can make a God out of so many things in our life. We can make a God out of, uh, years ago they used to give out Sunday school pins for people that never missed a Sunday in Sunday school. Well, it's good not to miss any Sunday. But guess what? What if there was a neighbor that had a great need? that day, that morning, and you needed to take them to the hospital or something. Wouldn't you agree it would be more godly to take the person to the hospital in this Sunday school? Now, I'm not saying people did that, but I'm just saying, I know of some people that would run over you to get to church, you know? I mean, you've broken down on the road. Now, if you've broken down every week, you know, we need to do something about that, you know? The devil's working in your life, and we need to, we need to get victory over the devil by, we need to find some of the Men or women who are mechanically inclined, and we need to fix your car so you can get to church, okay, and help you. We need to come by and pick you up, you know. Uh, but every week, that's a problem. That's one thing. But one week or so, that's all right. But, but God wants you to be planted by the water, and you've got to first remove the, the weeds, the false things you trust in, so that there might be room. See, when you get all that out of your life, now there's room to receive the blessing. How many of y'all want to receive the blessing? Amen. I do. I want it. But you've got to get rid of that false trust. And you know what? I hate all the difficulty that's happened in my life. God has changed me, though, for the better through a lot of bad things that have happened. Some of you who've known my family for a while know that over the last four years, we've had a lot of bad stuff happen to us, haven't we? We have. Some of you that know us, we've had a lot of bad stuff. And I wondered, God, what are you doing? But guess what? Now when I run into somebody that's having trouble in their life, I'm like, well, I know what that's like. Instead of condemning them and giving them, a, I mean, how many of y'all know Christian people that if something goes wrong in your life? The first thing they gonna do is try to lecture you and tell you what you did wrong, how you gonna fix it. You know, you ain't even trying to empathize with me. You just giving. You been there? I've been there. And you know, when those people come here, I'm like, I'm gonna get out of here. I'm gonna try to be flight and I don't even want to talk to them. You know, but somebody says, man, I know how that feels. Man, that's tough. You know. And then here, here's 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 what God did in my life to help me get through that. Don't mess up your suffering. You, you, your suffering was for a reason. Use it to be fruitful and bless other people. So do that. Get rid of the false trust. I've learned to trust in the Lord. I've learned to cry out to God for help. Because I love this in point B here. It says if we recognize that we are built for God and surrender to Him, then no matter what parts of ground might seem to lie around us, we will find that the soil around us will be moist enough for us to draw refreshment from it. It said He shall not fear when the heat comes. That's right. He will not fear when the heat comes. That's right. Because guess what? There's going to be healing water that's going to be sent to us. God's going to help us. God's going to supply that oil of grace, that water that we need through the Word. There's a deep well of grace that we can draw from, okay? But you've got to draw from it. I have to make a confession to you. I got away from my regular devotional study. I was, I was going to go a different direction and I didn't really have a plan for it like I should have. And I got to where I wasn't in my daily Bible reading like I should have been. I was studying for my lessons. And I got back to my, because I told you I'm an ADHD person. I need a structure. I went back to my devotional book again. And went back to picking up where it was. And I was amazed and reminded of how I needed that passage of Scripture each day. I needed that regular schedule. Some people will say, don't get locked into a schedule. It'll just become... Regular repetition. It could become a ritual. But for me, I need the ritual a little bit because I need that. And it helped me. And I, God began to again send 
sweet, refreshing grace into my life through the, the reading of the Word. And I began to pray more earnestly. And listen to what's going to happen here. It says in point C, trials shall come upon him. This is a quote from Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary. Trials shall come upon him as on all, nay, upon him especially. But he shall not sink under them, because the Lord is his secret strength. Just as roots spread out by a river or water force, draw hidden support from it. Look at, I'm going to look at Hebrews 12, 6, just a moment. And uh, we see this as the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens every son he receives. So guess what? There will be some times of chastening, of discipline. I can tell you, I've seen Bentley's team sometimes when they have not done what they ought to do, or they've made foolish mistakes in a game. The first thing, next practice they go to, what do you do? You run these things called suicides. Isn't that right, Bentley? How long is a suicide? How many yards? Is that from one end of the court to the other? How many times do you do that sometimes? If it's really bad and the coach is really mad at you, how many of them do he make y'all run? 10 or 15. 10 or 15. That's from one side of the court to the and back. Isn't that right? Is it, is it back before that's one? It's touching every line. Oh, touching every line. So from one end to the other. That's a, that's a suicide. I remember when I was in uh, 12th grade, we played this team that was much bigger than us, but we had beaten them 12 years in a row. And our team lost to them 26 to nothing. And our guys were out there running almost like they were in slow motion. They just went, I guess they just thought because we'd won 12 years in a row, we'd win again. And this coach was a very mild-mannered guy. But I remember I was told that the next Monday in practice, they had to run from one goal line, 100 yards, to the next goal line. And I mean, he was always a, a really patient, sweet coach, but he was hardcore that day because he couldn't tolerate them putting forth a half-hearted effort. It's okay to lose, but it wasn't okay to lose because you put forth a half-hearted effort because you were big-headed and thought you just naturally deserved to win. Well, God brings difficulties in their life. Trials will come on us. But we won't sink under them because the Lord is our secret strength. And so just as those roots spread out by the river, we're going to draw support even though we might not see where that support comes from. The Holy Spirit's going to move in our life. I would say here in point D that those who make their hope, God their hope, have enough in Him to make up the want of creature comforts. I love this quote from Matthew Henry. We need not be solicitous about the breaking of a sister as long as we have the fountain. Woo! That is good. Did you, did you get that? God may break a sister in our life uh, that holds water, these things. But don't worry about it because we've got the fountain. We always have the fountain. I remember the first time I read that. I was sitting in my desk at a church in Florida. I got up and run around my desk one time. I got so happy in the Lord. Amen. That blessed me to know that I have the fountain. Jesus himself said in John 7, the 37, he said that those who trust in the Lord, he said, we will be, we will have, you know what, I know that verse, but I done got wound up and can't quote it now. So I'm just going to go look at it because it's such a wonderful verse. I'm not going to butcher it because you need to hear this verse today. John chapter 7. Verse 37, Jesus said on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Listen to this. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Within you, there will be something that flows out. I believe one reason we've not made a difference in America for a long time. A lot of folks don't have a river of living water flowing out of them. It's not flowing out to the people you work with. Either Christians who are truly saved are trying to hide in the church. And we need to come to church. I want you to know I look forward to coming Amen. and being with y'all. I do. Right. But I don't ever again want to be a full-time staff member that's in the church building all day. If I am ever again, God calls me and allows me to be a full-time staff member, and you want me to be that, and you're able to do that, look, guys, I, I want to work a night or two at the restaurant. I want, to work, I want to do something out in the world. I want to be mentoring or tutoring kids. I don't want to be in the building all day. God's not called us to be in the building all day. I said, we come into the building to get encouraged to go out into the world. Okay? You know, uh, I don't agree with everything that they did. But, uh, you know, the J.D. Summer and the Stamps backed up Elvis Presley for years. One time Elvis ripped his pants and they took him 25 minutes to sew him back up. So they went out and sang gospel music to that crowd for 25 minutes. Just gospel music. One fellow got saved and became a pastor years later. You know, uh, Reba Rambo, who was with, y'all remember the Rambos? 
Reba, believe it or not, even though she's in the Southern Gospel world, she was one of the early contemporary Christian music people when she was a solo artist. And in the 80s, she had a chance. Donna Summer, remember Donna Summer? Okay. Donna Summer wanted her to tour with her some, and, and, and Reba said, I didn't do this. I didn't want to offend the Christians and to think I was too worldly. And I'm thinking, man, some of the people may need Jesus. And you were there. You know, sometimes we say, man, I wish I could be around all the Christian people. I don't like being around people who cuss or do other things. But you know what? They need to see you be different. They need to see something different about you. If y'all notice that when people really get down and out and have troubles in their life, they don't go to all the folks that always talk about Jesus or always act religious. They go to the one that's really living a different life and seem to have something in them. They'll come to you and start asking you to pray for them. Some of the most vile people. They won't want anybody else to know it. When you get along, they say, hey, come here. I've got something going on in my life. you pray for me? I believe that you know, God will listen to you. And, and don't let that go to your head because that's God listening to anybody cries out to him that's just a child of God. But be thankful that they're seeing Jesus in you. So we don't need to worry about God breaking these cisterns in our life. Okay, God may be allowing all kinds of difficulty to come in your life because He wants to break sin patterns in your life and rejoice in it because He's pointing you to the fountain. Jesus is the fountain and you'll be fruitful. And being fruitful doesn't mean living an easy life. As we said already in point C, the trials will come. Because the trials are coming, don't think you're not being fruitful. Okay? Fruitfulness, I mean, sometimes the fruit is a lot sweeter after it goes through a, a, a freeze. If it survives the freeze, the fruit's sweeter, isn't it? Okay? I mean, things that are easy all the time. Somewhere or another, we got this idea that if I serve Jesus, everything is easy. That prosperity gospel told us that. I'm looking at the life of Jesus. It was hard. I mean, people lied about it. He, he, he was worked a blue-collar job. He, he was, uh, it was hard. It was difficult. But, you know, I was a young kid. I mean, I was very young. I was born, really, a little bit while after I was born, the Jesus movement began. The last great revival we've had in America. And again, many uh, senior adults, you know, in churches that are active, they got saved during that time. And I praise God for that. And here's the thing. That young group found out that the hippie movement ain't working. Even George Harrison and his wife, Patty, when they visited the Hyde-Asbury uh, area in San Francisco said, wait a minute, we thought this was going to be a bunch of love and peace, but these folks are just stoned out on drugs. Even the mothers and their kids are stoned out on drugs. This is not good. This is not love and peace. This is not it. And some of the young people realized that they had been seeking God and all these other false religions, the Eastern New Age religions that were coming up, and they began to come to Jesus. And I said, you need to be ready. If you really live for Jesus, we'll be like Chuck Smith was out in California. A bunch of hippies shows up on his doorstep one day and said, we're saved. We don't know what to do. And he's a 40-year-old bald-headed fat man, and he, wasn't, he was far from the, uh, being a cool guy. But he began to realize what God was doing. I recognize God's doing something with young people, with the hip-hop movement. And I've gotten connected with them. I know people chuckle about that, but I'm like, well, that's, God's moving in that. If God's moving, I'm going to connect with them, okay? You know, I'm going to encourage them. You know, I've learned one thing. Like one thing about us that's getting old, we need to be speaking truth to that younger generation, okay? And encouraging them and steering them in the right pathway, being a father figure and a mother figure, okay? But hold on to that. We need not be solicitous about the breaking of a sister as long as we have the fountain. Lastly, I'm going to close with this as a... Instrumentalists come, the one trusting exclusively in Christ for salvation, for direction, for wisdom, for hope and strength, will find a deep well of assurance that results in much fruitfulness, stability, and peace. First Peter 5 says, 5 7 says, Cast your care upon him. Why? Because he does what? He cares for you. Hebrews 13 and 5. Jesus himself said, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Let's trust in Christ. Quit trusting in things. Quit trusting in programs. Programs are great. Church programs can help us. They can, especially ADHD people like me, need some, some guidance sometimes, you know. Need a, a structure. But don't trust in that structure. Trust in God. Trust in His power. Trust in what His Spirit can do. I want to invite you to stand with us today if you feel that you need to unite with our church. I said, come forward and, and we'll, we'll let you do that today. If you trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you say, I want to get on board with this church and I want to get on board with what God's doing, come on. If you need salvation, 
We will show you how to trust in Christ and live that blessed life. If you want somebody to pray for you and encourage you there, if you just want to come by and pray, you're welcome to do it. But do that as we say, footsteps of Jesus. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come follow me. Follow Jesus today. And we see where the footprints falling lead us to thee. Follow the footsteps of Jesus, okay? Follow his steps and he'll help you.